It doesn't strike me as an info cycle. It's more of a current event. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, I turned on the stream. Hi, if you're online watching. If you are listening online, we're going to start in like five minutes. So just take a seat. I hope you're in a seat. It would be weird if you weren't. Let's <laughs> give everybody a couple of minutes. So I read the read the trust one, the researcher for the capsule ship, password yep. manager, and I read some of the other ones that you said. Cool. Mostly, I mean, a lot of them you can kind of, you can reflect on them, you know, so I've read them. Thing, so. Just kind of, you know, whenever you want to chime in. Sure. Did you hear Trump's going to get a 60 very soon? I didn't know he already got five. 8G, 9G, 10G. It's like IPv, it's like IPv4 to IPv6. Don't worry about the other version. Yeah. 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 Jump right ahead. <laughs> I like how they had to post a retraction for that too. <laughs> they were actually those GPS and stuff. Yeah, they're like 130 bucks. I'm like, really? I think I got to verify this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I thought that they had one where like you had to send like a text message and tell you the GPS location. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think a lot. Yeah, like, so you can ping them. Yeah. yeah. And you can sing. Yeah, but they don't want like a live feed because yeah. then people well, can't. Well, Dreams of the Library. uses up the minutes and stuff because there's five of us. Yeah. But I think that what, what, uh, what I heard was they don't want people to make like rockets and like guide them to the and whatnot using GPS. So that's why there's like a delay and like, uh, it's a little bit inaccurate. Okay. Hi! What's up? Woo! End of what for most of you was probably midterm week. Yay. Okay, um, so we got some stuff to talk about first before we get to the news. Um, first going out today will be an email that has the registration link for the CTF contest. 
so people can start signing up teams. Um, the idea is that at one time you can sign up an entire team of four, or you can sign up as you know one, two, or three people, and then on the day of the contest we will group um, sort of all those piecemeal groups into teams of four um, to ensure that everyone has teams of four. Um, so that email will be going out. We'll probably post the link in Discord as well. Um, a second survey, we're just all about surveys. A second survey is going to, do you have a question? Are you just stretching? A uh, second survey is also going to be going out because a bunch of us want to have a Magic the Gathering tournament um, over Reading Week. Um, and this is going to, the survey is to decide what we're going to use for draft and what day it's going to be on. So if you want to come and geek out over the Reading Week, uh, fill out that survey. Uh, that'll also be in Discord and maybe over an email as well. Uh, so uh, no, I don't know. It's not my event. I'm just showing up. Um, do we have anything to say about sweaters? Do we need to say anything about sweaters? There was some sweater chat last time. I don't know if that was. The order forms should be out and available for everyone through the email and posted in the announcements channel in our Discord. So uh, prices are on there as well. I believe they're 62 something. We're looking two weeks from now. I think it was the March 7th. Yeah, Mar March 7th. March 7th. Yeah. yeah. Is the so due date to get your sweater in? I talked with Christian today. He said please step more faster. So. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't spoken to him since I uh, we first organized yeah, this. Yeah, because he, he's concerned that if he doesn't get enough orders, then he can find them go through, right? So. Oh, yeah, there's, 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 there's usually a minimum order a minimum of, of like eight or so. Uh, yeah, so 12, 12. 12. So, if you want your sweaters, get on get those forms in. Cool. Yeah, that's, pretty much the sweater. Yeah. 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 that's that's the sweater yeah. there. Where else will be waiting next year? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any other club news before we do news news? Yeah. To other the other club administrative people. Is there anything else we want to say? Uh, I don't know. This CPS stuff is in development. If anyone is interested in oh, yeah. challenge development. Yeah. We we could definitely use a couple more hands for challenge dev, but whatever. We'll get by. Um, I assume there's a number of people going to Monahans. Yeah, for the wrap. Raise your hands, we're going to the bar after. It's called the M Wing. Yeah, what are you talking about? Or the East Campus. Yeah, there's a number of people. No, I'm already done. I'm done. Good. Okay. You can just sleep at the school. I feel like that's round. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Don't sleep at the school. Yeah. 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 Don't sleep at the school. Okay, so um, moving right along. By the way, everybody welcome our new co host. This is Adam. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> After my call last time, he bravely stepped forward and said, totally, I will co-host with you, you great big jerk. What is his name? Adam. Adam. <laughs> I, was the, I was already commenting in the, when I was uh, in the crowd, so now I'm up That's here. That's fair, yeah. So we'll see how it goes. Here on the microphone. Yeah, yeah. So um, first article this week is from TechCrunch. Um, basically, the art, um, Zach, the writer who also runs that really good InfoSec mailing list that basically emails out a summary of really good uh, weekly InfoSec news stories. Um, hop on his mailing list if you can find the link to it. It's really good. Uh, but he was saying, you know, in the light of a lot of the recent data breaches, um, he was looking through a lot of the statements that companies had issued. And um, he and a number of other people take issue with this phrase that seems to show up a lot, which is we take um, either your, your privacy or the safety of your data very seriously, and it means a lot to us. But they always seem to say this after the breach, right? Or maybe it's part of some policy that they never really talk about. And so his survey sort of indicated about one third of all 285 data breach notifications that he read had some variation of that line in it. And he was trying to call them out, basically, on it, um, and saying that you know they were doing some just words to try to downplay um, people's concerns over being part of a data breach. Um, and just saying that really, like if they did take our, our information and our privacy and our data uh, and that they're, they're safeguarding over that seriously, we wouldn't have many of these, maybe as many of these data breaches as we have. Um, yeah. Uh, also, he made another really good point that if we took this stuff really seriously, um, we might not even have some of these information harvesting companies like Google and Facebook because other people wouldn't be sharing and buying the data with them and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of his take on it. I don't know if you want to yeah. chime in or say well, anything on that. It goes back to uh, if, if you don't pay for it, then you're the product. So, yeah. That's a fair point. I mean, and, and we all know that with a lot of these words, um, that's the case. So um, I'm kind of glad that he called him out on that. That's good. By the way, I, I just noticed this cool 
Anybody see like the little mark on the reader here? And as I scroll down, it shows me how far through the article I am. That's kind of awesome. That's a nice little like feature. I like that. Cool. Yeah, good on TechCrunch. That's just a nice little user experience feature. Good for them. Right. Um, do you want to comment on this one first? Uh, actually, I didn't read that. Okay. One. Yeah. No problem. So um, Google got uh, under a bit of heat this week when people were like, "Hey, so there's a microphone in the Nest," and they never really advertised the fact that there was a microphone in the Nest. They were saying it wasn't really a secret, but we just didn't tell anybody it was there. <laughs> Why is there a microphone? Um, they're claiming for a number of reasons. Um, I know generally with things like the thermostats, it's to uh, pick up like ambient instructions or maybe integration with uh, what's Google's Siri called? Google, Google. Google. Yeah, Google Assistant, Google Home, or whatever. Um, yeah, um, they're saying it wasn't supposed to be a secret. They just neglected to tell people that it was there. Yeah. Well, is it? I mean, it's a form of lying information. I mean, if you you know if you opened up the hardware, you would see a microphone there. Yeah. So they weren't like concealing it. But anyways, they got in trouble for that. Um, yeah, that's not great, especially, you know, given that they've been under some additional uh, fire recently and stuff like that. Um, yeah. It's never been on and is only activated when users specifically enable the option, whatever option that was. So, I don't know. Um, not great, though, for a company looking to, you know, issue more in the home devices and, and get more into that market. Um, hiding microphones is not a good thing. Doesn't that break their, the thing that they said, how we never use it? They said you have to enable it. Yeah, they got to turn on a feature that, whatever, yeah. uses it for now. Yeah. Exactly, so. I don't know. Probably detects when a person's home by yeah. Ambient noise or whatever. Probably should list that as a feature. Yeah. I mean, sure, if I want to, like, voice activate my my thermostat, that'd be cool. Be like, yo, it's hot in here, and it goes, ch -ch -ch, and turns it down or something, but... It would make that sound. It doesn't actually click, but it would do that. Um, I don't know. But again, tell me. Tell me that that's there, because I want to know that you're listening to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is a fun story. Yeah, so right, here you go. Um, so basically, it just, the article says, yeah, shipping is important. Um, and XP is back from the dead, or never died. So yeah, that's fun. Because that's what boats run. Exactly. And it's this usual culprits, poor password security, and bad patching for IoT. Um, yeah, and it's a hard problem to solve, especially for IoT. Um, and then, so, yeah, and of course, uh, companies want more and more granular control over their assets. Shipping is, like a, you want to have control over your asset for a boat and have a lot of technology to control it and whatnot. Uh, but they forget about um, the security aspect of it. You can see if you can access it remotely, who else can? And how hard is it for other people to do it? Um, it also, the article mentioned a few interesting things, which is uh, who, is in, who is responsible for what? Um, the ship owners are rarely the ship operators. Charter parties are rarely interested in security. So kind of like who is responsible for patching and why? Like a lot of these ships are very expensive in the millions or even billions, I want to say, but I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, keeping up to date and patched, probably a good idea. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I helped somebody do some analysis, some of the systems that are on boats. Like, boats are these giant, like, isolated networks. There's actually a lot of IT on one of these shipping freight containers that you might not recognize is there. A lot of their operations are essentially automated, not to mention all the stuff that syncs up with the port when they get there, the transfers over manifests and helps them with their inventory control. So there's a lot of systems on boats and because they're mobile, they're gonna touch a few different networks on their trip too. Mm -hmm. right? So there's a number of avenues that bad guy could use to um, try to infect a boat. They mentioned through the article here and you touched on it, um, like one, lots of different devices. Some of them are really old. The operators of the ship don't necessarily have the ability to like change and update these things. Stuff like this, like these Moxa device servers, these are like serial communications devices that then expose some sort of TCP network connection so you can talk to like things that move via the internet, which is a little bit scary. Um, yeah, so, yeah, scary. Um, but the fact that it's like straight out of hackers, like the movie, because that was the whole bad guy plot, right? Um, I infected a bunch of your ships, and I'm going to capsize your oil tankers if you don't give me money. So um, now we can look back and say maybe that what movie wasn't totally out of the blue in its predictions. Actually, if you scroll down, you yeah. see the same thing right here. 
It was oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Three minute read. Wow, that's like a, a quick. Yeah. I like that they do this. This is fun. And I think a couple of years ago when ransomware was just ramping up, uh, one of the biggest operators got hit with ransomware. Yes. That affected some of their ships. Yeah, you're right. I think I remember. I think we talked about that one because I think I made the same reference to the hackers movie at the time. Although this is even closer, so that's cool. Yeah. Do you want to start off? Yeah. Sure. Um, so basically, it's uh, kind of a good sign saying that um, the U.S. administration is saying that they're trying to take. They acknowledge that security threats are important, and uh, you should probably do them. Also, another interesting point um, that I that I saw was that they want to interact more with industry and uh, talk with them how how that will work. Um, so yeah, I heard that from somewhere else. Another podcast from someone from the NSA said similar. They want to integrate more with with uh, industry. So yeah, um, it's not. I mean, it's still got a long ways to go. Uh, it's just only high level goals, and so it'll take time to trickle down. Um, but at least they're acknowledging it and they're, they're doing baby steps here. So, yeah, it's good. So, yeah, let's check out these high-level goals that they have identified. Um, protecting and securing the American way of life. So, if we just kind of maybe look at the first part, let's just ignore the, like, rhetoric in the second half. Um, protecting and securing, like, American communications and security and stuff, which is great. That's a good idea. Um, that was supposed to be part of the NSA's role. Um, but then they turned a little bit more spyish. I don't know. Um, but cool. It's always nice when federal agencies issue good direction in terms of how to secure stuff for their citizens, um, or if they take proactive steps to do that. We've featured uh, the CSE and CSIS recently for some of their more recent outreach towards the community uh, and industry in terms of you know privacy comics and, and other guidelines to help people with that stuff. And they also good. said that they be do offensive measures as well. So that's the yep. um, command, and, command <laughs> and control. So they separated as NSA, which is defensive, and then the com cyber command, which is supposed to be offensive. Yep. So, yeah. Um, I mean, focus on American prosperity, I assume just kind of boils down to protecting, protecting their business interests um, using InfoSec. Peace through strength, again, I think would tie into what you just mentioned. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to not just be a safe nation, but maybe be a bit proactive in there as well. Yep. Um, and also efforts to disrupt, deter, degrade, or destabilize. Mm -hmm. uh, and advance American influence. That's kind of terrifying. Uh, let's just not comment on that one. So there is uh, also um, the issue of like if cyber, for example, a, a nation state wanted to attack a company, who would who's responsible to defend it? Is it the should the government be responsible for dealing with nation states, or should the companies just have to deal with it too? So I guess the U.S. is wanting to step up to the plate. Yeah. yeah? Well, those are interesting strings, but they are. What if they? Because it's in print, doesn't mean it's true. And do they have the capability to deliver on the promises that are there? Maybe not, but I mean, well, maybe not right now, right? As as we often like to comment, I mean, policy at the upper level drives all the stuff below that, right? So if they're laying this out saying, here's our strategy, maybe that's going to start pushing stuff, right? They wish they could do that. Yeah, well, yeah. got to start somewhere, I guess. I'm just saying. That's yeah. No, no, that's fair. <laughs> um, I mean, just because something's written down does, like, also doesn't mean that people are necessarily going to do it, yeah. right? Um, like when everybody read all of the school's policies when you first started coming here. Have you followed every policy to the letter? Like I totally <laughs> adhere to this. I totally adhere to the dress code, like 24/7. Um, so does that mean they're going to get rid of the Patriot Act? No, <laughs> they love that. They are. That is never going away, much to our chagrin. Okay, this was probably the most highly contested story of uh, the last few days. Basically, someone did a study of some password managers and found that like all software, password managers have some vulns associated with them. Um, especially when it comes to basically grabbing memory and unmasking things like some hidden passwords, right? Yes, you can do this um, because those passwords gotta get stored somewhere when you're using them, right? So they're gonna be in RAM. Um, and if you can unmask that stuff, in theory, yes, it's a vulnerability. Um, so the argument is that they're not foolproof and they're not perfect. 
However, the problem was that a lot of people in InfoSec didn't get past not even the entire headline. They just, they got to here and they assumed that the article was suggesting we just not use password managers anymore. It was a big flare up of personalities on Twitter that were like, how dare you say that? It's, uh... I mean, they weren't really saying not to use them. They're just saying there's vulnerabilities in them, right? I, I think we all still would probably agree that they're a good solution, generally speaking, to a problem, despite the fact that they might have vulnerabilities. Just like, it's my opinion, not everybody's, but um, 2FA that uses text messages to your phone is better than no 2FA at all. It's not as good as the app, but it's better than not having it at all. Because yes, you can hijack someone's account if you social engineer their telco and all that junk. But So this is the thing, right? Like there's, I don't know, there's ones. They're gonna be there, mostly around unmasking. Um, like right here, should you stop using it? And this basically just says, no, no, don't throw that away. Um, yeah. And other programs use it. Like for example, BitLocker, if you do, uh, do memory dump, you can get the BitLocker key, right? So a lot of other programs use it. Uh, for me, when I was reading it, it was kind of disappointing seeing the password manager's reactions. They were very more defensive. And for a security-minded organization, or should be a security-minded organization, um, they didn't really uh, take it to heart as well, and they were more on the defensive side instead of proactive side. Even though last pass they said issued a patch a few days later, they're like, yeah, don't worry about it, and then issued a patch. Um, so yeah, just uh, kind of a difficult problem. Isn't it still just largely beneficial that people in the company just use different passwords for each account, as long as they're accomplishing that and using some way to store that so they don't have to remember everything? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I would agree with that. That you yourself managing large, complex passwords for all your services is better than using a password manager. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm just saying that being the fact that you're able to have different passwords is better security than whatever security is on the password manager. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. The person's not going to remember all those passwords. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just saying that's why you should be using the password. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because really the, the biggest benefit of these things is not relying on you to remember a unique complex password for every website. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm just saying that the issue of the password manager not being as secure is not the person can use credential stuff to access your accounts because you're using different passwords for everything. Yes, mm -hmm. that's correct. And also yeah. you don't remember most of the passwords. Like most of the yeah. passwords I store with, with my password manager, I don't remember they are. So no, if like LastPass was, was breached, <coughs> Like uh, then they didn't steal the they still stole the encrypted data. I, it wouldn't matter because I didn't know them in the first place anyway. So yeah, I, just I have no them. exactly. I just know the master password. Yeah. That's one thing to remember. Yeah, uh, I don't know any of my passwords anymore. Yeah, yeah. And there was one more thing that I mentioned. They did mention that uh, the ish, the attack that they were able to run. It was when the program not they weren't able to get the password the passwords when the program was running. But when they were shutting, ending the process, mm -hmm. when they were killing the process, that's when they leaked the information because they didn't do proper uh, memory uh, sanitation. I mm -hmm. think that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, that'll work. So that's that's uh, one yeah, thing to point, point out. Hmm. Yeah. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Really old flaw in WinRAR leaves people open to remote code execution. Um, basically, there was like some sort of path traversal issue when you're unpackaging a WinRAR thing that would allow someone to run code on your machine. Um, 19 years old in WinRAR. I mean, I don't know if I've used WinRAR in the last 19 years. That's how long it's been asking you to. <laughs> I, I, I've run Linux. When was the last time I installed WinRAR, right? Although the odd person still submits me assignments in a RAR archive. Yeah. And that leaves me scratching my head, wondering what, <laughs> like, what year it is. Windows does come with the built-in zip, which is a zip uh, functionality, so yeah. I don't know why, why you still install it. Fair enough. Well, it's not great, but yeah. Um, so uh, basically, they were fuzzing it with uh, the Windows version of AFL, which is interesting, because this is a, a slightly newer spin on AFL, which is... American fuzzy loop, lop, something like that, um, for fuzzing binaries. And someone recently kind of made a version or forked it and made a version that was a little bit more Windows friendly. So people have been fuzzing loads and loads of Windows apps in the meantime. 
Are you recording? Are you about to turn What's going on here? Um, and yeah, so that's where they found this path, tra path traversal thing. And it's basically when you're decompressing uh, ACE archives, I think it was. Yeah. Um, which is just an archive file format. And, and the idea is that it would allow you to um, execute stuff because of some vulns in the parsing of that archive format. So, yeah, neat. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this was neat because so there was an article and then a bit of a backtrack on the article and um, Craig issued some updates. So at first they thought they found new fuel pump skimmers that um, supported all kinds of crazy Bluetooth functionality and GSM connectivity to the cell network for reporting all of the stolen details from these skimmed phones. And it turned out that no, whoever find, found the device just kind of ID'd the device wrong. Like, yes, that's a SIM card but this thing's actually a GPS module. It's not a Bluetooth module. Yep. Um, so really, this is one of those things that you like attach to people's cars to follow them around. Because um, there's probably like, buried in the back there a battery or something like that. Um, Did they not watch uh, Better Call Saul? Like it's literally one of the episodes. <laughs> what, like attaching a GPS thing to someone's? To the gas, yeah. The guy broke down his car and wasn't able to find any GPS tracker. Mm -hmm. And then he goes back into like the little Store and he sees the uh, fuel pump, uh, like the, the caps, the gas caps, yeah. caps, and then hmm. he went back, checked the cap, and boom, it was the GPS tracker. Nice. Yeah, they make these things really small too. Like you can buy them on Amazon for dirt cheap. They're like yeah. tiny little Android boxes, like that. Yeah. Um, any additional comment? No, not really. It's pretty straightforward. I was just kind of interested that they were selling those things. I was like, oh, really? You can buy one of those? Yes. It's only 130 bucks. Yeah. I gotta well, verify they're, that. They're, <laughs> they're cheaper ones out there than that. They're just not, oh, yeah. not as awesome. Just um, check AliExpress. It's yeah. Usually top seller. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that says a lot about us as a society. The fact that like this sketch little GPS tracker is like a number one selling item. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. We're we're doing well as a society. Good. Do they accept Bitcoin though. That's, That's even better. <laughs> now I'm like with my anonymous currency going to sketch by something. Okay. Um, so maybe some political parties in the US or UK are getting targeted um, by data breaches. Um, mostly I wanted to highlight this one as a general trend from the last few years of political parties being the target of attempts to get their email and do other data breach stuff. That's concerning given, given the number of like high profile political activities that are happening right now in a lot of countries, like the UK dealing with the Brexit thing, um, upcoming elections in Canada and the US. So the fact that a lot of parties have been under fire right now from um, cyber criminals, not such a good trend. Hopefully they shore up mm -hmm. their stuff. <clears throat> that's, that's kind of that. I mean, even like a uh, people that are involved in Brexit, they've been saying, like, be careful what you say because like, there's a lot of spies in the area. Mm -hmm. I read an article about that. Um, so, yeah, people want to know what's going on with Brexit. It's, it's like, oh, and the news almost at basically every single day, mm -hmm. uh, Brexit. So, yeah, people want to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, so, totally. Yeah. And to blackmail politicians, I'm sure, like, they want to do that because it's the thing. Um, a pretty big Drupal uh, remote code execution vulnerability. So again, if you don't know, we mentioned Drupal the odd time here, but it's a content management system or CMS. Um, it's basically used for you know like uploading files and managing content within a network and an organization and stuff. Um, so their some of their REST APIs apparently were not quite locked down, and because of a, another path traversal vulnerability. Um, issuing the right kind of request to a, a Drupal app through its REST API could give you um, code execution on the Drupal server. So not great um, because that means all this stuff was internet facing and remote code execution on stuff that's internet facing is a nightmare. There's a great big CVE for it um, and there's a patch out that people need to patch. Yeah. Drupal's been hit a lot this year. Like They've been yeah. issuing a lot of patches. There was that one uh, a couple months back where they said, like, be ready, we're going to drop a very important security patch. <laughs> it's, it is scriptable. At this time, they said, like, a week, two weeks before or something like that. Two, or two weeks ago, two weeks before, they even released the patch. And then once it patched, um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, probably other than WordPress, they're the CMS that's been, have, like, has sort of a pretty bad track record recently. I assume also just because it's popular. Um, it's, it's easy to set up. It's easy it's to the use. Second most used. Yeah, the second. next to WordPress. WordPress yeah. Yeah, WordPress. Wow, both PHP. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. 
It's almost like that language has been around forever. It runs a lot of the internet. Oh, speaking of WordPress. Oh, no. It's been like two weeks since we hit on WordPress. Um, so this one's been around for a while, apparently. Like, they checked the code base. goes back about six years. Um, oh, what was this one? <laughs> Look, past traversal and local file inclusion. Past traversal, back with a vengeance. That's interesting. Um, but this one, you actually have to be an authenticated user. You have to have author status on the blog. Um, and then some somehow with your uh, abilities as author, you can get um, codecs on the box. So, yeah, I mean, it still sucks that this phone is there and leads to code execution. But you have to be like an authenticated user to the Drupal account in the first place. So yeah, the, the, the risk here is you have someone that writes for you and has access to the blog. Now they can potentially get access to the server. Mm -hmm. nice. Just because it's always fun to point out WordPress. Everyone well, still we uses it. Dr Drupal, we might as well point out well. WordPress as well. Yeah, I mean, as well. Number, number two and number one. Um, update coming that's going to replace hashes on Windows patches. Uh, they're going to replace what was SHA-1, just with not SHA-1, um, because that algorithm's starting to die a little bit. Uh, I, what are they replacing it with, did they say? Uh, I didn't read uh, this one. No, neither did I. <laughs> I SHA-2, I, I see SHA-2 there. They're, they're talking, oh, no, oh just, just SHA-2. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Well, good for them. Yeah. Staying on top of the hash, it's very important. Yeah, good. Uh, this was funny. Um, so Schneider's pointing to this product here, which is a USB cable that has Bluetooth in it, or sorry, Wi-Fi in it, in a USB oh. cable. Um, someone's just demonstrating here how tiny, because stuff like ESP32 chips are tiny and itty bitty, and you can basically fit them into the cap for a USB chip. So now I can have Wi-Fi control over my USB, and that's bad because in theory that allows me to send commands over Wi-Fi into the USB into the computer. Um, that that is theoretically possible. So um, not great. There's been a similar product that I saw, which was like Bash Bunny, I think it was, a rubber ducky, and yeah, they so also they utilize the um, inherent, like the by default um, networking capabilities of USB. So yeah. Look how tiny this is, though. It's so big. I mean, hey, it's a feature. They were selling these uh, Bluetooth like aux uh, ports, so you plug it into the USB and then you plug it into the aux port, and they're only like three inches long. Mm -hmm. And there's no, it's just straight USB to aux port, so you can barely tell that there's like a chip in there. Yeah. Well, look, look how tiny this thing is. I have one of these on my desk, and it is itty, itty, bitty. The problem is getting it the right amount of power, but if you're plugged into a USB port, that's where it's getting the power from. So, awesome. What do you do with it? What do I do with it? Science. Obviously. <laughs> Science. I was trying to fit one into one of those little square white Apple wall chargers and fit it inside the housing. That's where I'm trying to see if I can fit it into. I haven't gotten there yet. I'm not that good at uh, electrics. Um, nope. I think that was the list of articles. That was, yeah. that was kind of it, other than um, some of those things. There wasn't a lot. Um, before I turn off the stream, is there anything we want to say? Hey, great job, Adam. Congrats. Thank you. On your first co-host. <laughs>